I want to welcome you to our Lenten Vespers service. We are glad to have you here tonight. We have enjoyed a wonderful meal for our our bodies, but now we will enjoy the meal of supping together from uh, the living water and from the bread of life. Uh, And so we will enter into worship together as we reflect on who our God is and what he has done for us. And so I would ask you all to stand now for our opening call to worship. It is in your programs in front of you, which we will say together in unison. Eternal God, your kingdom has broken into our troubled world through the life, death, and resurrection of your Son. Help us to hear your word and obey it, that we may become instruments of your saving love. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And please remain standing as we sing together out of our blue hymnals in front of you, hymn number 473, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. Indeed, this whole Lenten season, we realize that we need to take it to the Lord in prayer, because Jesus Christ is our friend, is our Lord, and is our God. And when we call upon His name, He will hear us, and He will respond. And so we will begin with prayer to our God. At the end of this prayer, I will give us an extended time of silent meditation in which we can come before our God uh, in prayer uh, individually. Uh, but before I do, um, I do want us to pray for uh, a friend of the church, a new member, uh, Lanny Kretschmer. Uh, Lanny suffered a heart attack uh, earlier in the week. Um, he is doing 
well now. He is hospitalized right now, and they are considering uh, surgery options. Um, I talked to him on the phone today. Uh, he seemed pretty positive, um, and so we're just going to uh, keep praying for Lanny. Um, but uh, during our time of silent prayer, um, be sure to lift his name up and any other names that God puts on your heart. So now let us take it to our Lord in prayer. Dear God, you have chosen us. You have set us aside for service in the places where we live, where we work, and where we move. You have called us to be lights in dark places, drawing others into your glorious light. You have called us to speak out, proclaiming your love, justice, and mercy. You have called us to be neighbors to all people. For this privilege of service, we thank you, but also ask humbly for your power and strength, without it which we can do nothing. Our Heavenly God, we pray that you will lead us to our neighbors wherever they might be, that we might share your love for their lives. Our neighbors who surround us where we live, our neighbors who work with us, Our neighbors who we pass on the street or sit next next to us at church. May we be the smile that greets, the reassuring word, the helpful comment, the willing ear, the shoulder to cry on, the gift that blesses their life this day. Fill us, Lord, we pray, with your spirit that we might live and work to your praise and to your glory. And now, God, we pray that you will hear us as we each come before you, silently opening up our hearts and our minds into your love and into your strength. Hear our prayers. Our loving God, we thank you that you are responding to these needs and you are meeting us where we are at. And we pray for your blessing upon our service tonight. Amen. Well, tonight we have very special musical guests. We want to welcome up Gracious Inspiration, along with their accompanist, uh, Leanne Strobel. So, um, Loreen Strobel, sorry. Don't know why I call you Leanne sometimes, but... Uh, Let's welcome them. Oh 
born sacred head pierced by our thorns it is finished was his cry the perfect lamb was crucified his sacrifice our victory our savior chose the mercy tree oh, when dark that violent day the whole earth quaked at love's display three days That was amazing. Thank you so much. That was a beautiful song. Uh, now we want to dismiss the children and the youth to head on back to their time. Um, and as they do, um, if you'd like, uh, you can turn to page 98 in your New Testament uh, Bibles in front of you in the New Testament. We're going to be reading from John 6, uh, 30 through 40. And we are continuing on uh, with the uh, petitions of the Lord's Prayer. The first three petitions that we have already looked at, both Wednesday night and Sunday mornings, um, are petitions that are directed towards our God, um, our Father who art in heaven, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. But now we are directing into what is called the us petitions, where we are praying for ourselves. And Jesus knew this was an essential part of prayer. That as we gave glory and praise to our God, then we would come to Him and we would ask for strength for our lives. 
And today we are talking about the daily bread that is shared. And it's that everyday provision. And we are reminded by the manna that fell from heaven. God instructed them only to collect what they could eat for that day. Anything beyond that would go to waste. And so it's that idea in that sense that God will give us what we need when we need it. We just have to pray and trust in Him. And so I want to read to you a scripture about bread. So they said to him, what sign are you going to give us then so that we might see it and believe in you? What work are you performing? This is what the crowd was asking of Christ. And he said, our ancestors ate the manna, or they said our ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness. As it is written, they gave him bread from heaven to eat. And then Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, it was not Moses who gave you bread from heaven, but it was my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is that which comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. They said to him, Sir, give us this bread always. And Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. But I said to you that you have seen me, and yet you do not believe. Everything that the Father gives me will come to me, and anyone who comes to me I will never drive away. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise up on the last day. This is indeed the will of my Father, that all who see the Son and believe in Him may have eternal life, and I will raise them up on the last day. And so we praise God for His Word this morning, this evening as well. You can never get these Wednesday nights right. Uh, but tonight is our... Um, another edition of uh, our DVD from Adam Hamilton on the Lord's Prayer, and we will be focusing on our, give us our daily bread. It's great to be with you again for session three of our study of the Lord's Prayer. And we come to a really important line in the prayer. And so I want to remind you, we began, and why don't we say uh, these words together again. So we started with, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And then we went to, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. So now we come to the next line. What is it? Give us this day our daily bread. All right, give us this day our daily bread. So that's what we're going to focus today, is what did Jesus have in mind when, we're, when he told us to pray, give us this day our daily bread. So first of all, I want you to think about bread in the Bible. And as you think about that, there's a whole lot of references to bread in the Bible. Over 300 uh, passages in Scripture that refer to bread. And uh, I'm just wondering, you know, what comes to mind for you? Any, anything, just shout it out. Manna. manna. Okay, so manna. God provided daily bread for the people in, in the wilderness. Yeah. What else? Bethlehem. Bethlehem, okay, which means house of bread. And, uh, and certainly stories happen there, like Ruth's story, and of course the birth of Christ happens in the house of bread, who, you know, the one who becomes the bread of life. I mean, it's such a great, that name Bethlehem is just so awesome. Okay, what else? Right, breaking of the bread in the Eucharist, and Jesus, when he's uh, feeding the multitudes, he breaks the bread, he gives thanks, he blesses it, he breaks it. The word Eucharist means to give thanks, and so every time he breaks the bread, he gives thanks. Sure, somebody else said something back here. The Last Supper, exactly. So at the Last Supper, he's taking the Passover Seder bread and he's reinterpreting the meaning of this sign act, right? He's taking the bread that meant one thing, God's deliverance of the Israelites from slavery in Egypt and how God, you know, 
They, they had to move quickly because and their bread couldn't rise and the unleavened bread and a way every year of remembering God's deliverance, God's central saving act of the Hebrew Bible. Jesus transforms that so that the central saving act of God in history is Jesus giving himself for us. And so this bread is my body given for you. But as we think about that, we find that in the Bible, bread is both bread. It's actually the stuff that you have to eat. And so there's the bread of life you have to eat, right? And, and this is how grains are, you know, people process their grains this way. They, they broke it down, created bread, they ate it. This is essential stuff of life. But bread is also used in the Bible to talk about other things, to talk about deeper things, the kinds of things that we need to live that aren't what we put into our mouths, but into our hearts. And so both of those show up throughout Scripture. And that's Part of what we're thinking about when we look at this verse. So give us this day our daily bread. Now, I don't know about you. I've been fortunate. I've never felt uh, like I didn't have enough to eat. Um, I, there's always been something in the pantry. Levon and I got married. We lived below the poverty level for the first year we were married, literally. $1,000 below the poverty level. But we always had enough to eat. We, we just did. And so I don't know what it's like to go to bed at night wondering if I will have something to eat tomorrow. But there are people, millions of people, hundreds of millions of people, perhaps billions of people, who struggle with food insecurity. And so when we think about that, of course, this prayer is about that too, right? Give us this day our daily bread. And the us here is, again, maybe it's not me, but it's all of the other us's out there who are struggling to have their daily bread. In part, this line in the prayer is meant to remind us that there are people that are hungry out there or food insecure, but it's not just to remind us, it's to call us to action, right? So when we pray for... Um, us to have our daily bread, for those who need it to have their physical daily bread, we remember Ora et Labora, right? We pray and we work. So we look to see, what can I do to be a part of providing for those who might not have enough to eat? So this prayer is, of course, about providing for our daily bread. And our daily bread is all of the hours who don't have enough to eat. And so we look for that. This, this should be a regular rhythm of a Christian. And when we pray the Lord's Prayer, it's a reminder I am supposed to be part of my mission in life, part of bringing God's kingdom to come on earth as it is in heaven, is being mindful of people who may not have enough and making sure that I share. So uh, how God answers that prayer? God answers that prayer usually through people. I mean, with the Israelites in the wilderness, God provided manna. But most of the time, actually, I've never known of anybody waking up who was food insecure and finding manna on their, on their yards, if they have a yard. Um, God doesn't send angels with wings to drop food by people's homes. He sends angels with flesh like us. Right? The word angel means messenger, and he sends human messengers. And so the way this works is while we're praying this, we're meant to be mindful of and then asking, what can I do? How can I help? So I think about this rhythm of how this works. And some years ago, I was, I've been multiple times to Malawi in central, South Central Africa. And uh, we'd gone on a, on a trip to try to discern how would God, we felt like God wanted us to be there and, and to be engaged somehow as a congregation, to partner in Malawi. But we didn't know how. And so we went and the, the leaders of the church took us to various villages. So we went to one village out in a rural area. It took forever to get there. And it was just this, you know, it was a, it was a very, what we would consider a primitive village. I mean, people living in mud brick homes and there was no, there was no water source in the village. There was a water source outside the village, and it was just a hole in the ground with greenish water in it. And there people took their buckets, and they went down and they filled them, put them on their heads, and they went back to their homes. So we arrived there, and we met the village elders. And I remember we were praying on the way, Lord, please help us to discern. What, do you want us to be involved here? What would that look like? Please guide us. And we met with the village elders, and we said, you know, we've come just trying to discern if God wants us to partner in any way, and is there any way that you know, you could imagine us, you know, standing with you and partnering with you. And the village elders said, it's really interesting that you should say that because we've been praying that God will help us have clean drinking water. And we know it's only 500 feet or whatever the distance is under, underground. We don't have the access, the tools to be able to get to it. And we're tired of our children being sick with dysentery. And so we have been praying and you showed up. And I thought, you know, how cool is that? Because they actually literally saw us as God's provision for their prayer in essence, give us this day our daily bread. And we saw them as God's answer. The fact that they'd been praying that, we saw them as God's answer to our prayer, what do you want us to do? And they walked us down to this water source and they said, you know, we, it would just be wonderful if our children could have clean drinking water. It's like, okay. We, we prayed about that and we felt like we're supposed to do this. And so you see that you become, again, we talked about this last session, you become the answer to other people's prayers and 
often other people are the answer to your prayers. And that's how it worked in both cases here. And, and then what you find is that in the midst of providing the needs for other people, you find your need for a different kind of daily bread. You know, the, the need for meaning and purpose and joy and, and feeling like you're a part of, you know, something God is doing. And part of what we find is that in the, I think in the developed world, and in particular in uh, middle class and upper middle class and upper class communities, upper income communities, that there are people who have everything and they're famished. They're impoverished because they don't have what really satisfies us. And so we're constantly trying to find something else that's going to make us happy. Something else will make us satisfied. So we buy a new car, a new house, new, sometimes we get a new spouse. We, whatever it is, we get these things because we think, surely I'll, I'll finally be satisfied. But like Mick Jagger in the Stones, I can't get no satisfaction. No matter how hard I try, and I try, and I try, and I try, I can't get it. Because we're looking in all the wrong places. Give us this day our daily bread. By the way, it's interesting uh, when we think about daily bread. <clears throat> so there's some question as to what that word means, daily. In the Greek, it's epiousios or epiousion. And uh, epi means about, on, atop, uh, around. And ousion is from, or ousios is being or essence. So if you know Christian theology, there was this, dis you know, discussions around the development of the creeds. That, you know, Jesus is homoousios with the Father. They are of one substance. The Trinity is, you know, all three members are of one ousios, the one ousion, one substance, one essence. So, so... He says, give us this day our on substance, our on essence bread, our essential bread, the bread that we need. And some need the kind of bread that you eat. And some need the kind of bread that has to do with our meaning and our purpose and feeling loved and valued. And, and so when I think about that, I think about uh, Abraham Maslow. And you remember the, the hierarchy of needs, right? And there's been critiques of this idea, but I think there's some value still in it. Maslow, you know, suggested that there were some basic fundamental needs that we all have, and until those are met, we can't likely pursue higher needs, and then there's a sort of hierarchy that goes higher and higher, and I just want to remind you of some of these, and this is traced out in different ways by different people, and I'm grateful for this board to be able to show you, but so just, just as a simple reminder, you know, you start off with the most essential needs, and those are the physiological needs for food, water, shelter, uh, warmth, rest, all of those things we have to have. Until those are met, it's hard for people to think about anything besides that. Some people do, but it's hard to think beyond that. And, and then you move beyond that to safety needs. And so the need for safety, security, uh, that becomes clear. After that, we start getting to the higher level needs, uh, belonging and uh, the needs for love and intimacy. And so we all have those needs for relationships, and we have, you know, we have the need to feel like our lives matter. Um, esteem needs come next. And these are uh, feelings of accomplishment or like, like my life matters or I've made a difference somehow or I'm somebody, you know, I've noticed. And then finally, the self-actualization needs. And these are the ones that have to do with realizing your potential. And Maslow, uh, the older he got, the more he began to think about this idea of uh, self-actualization and actually started adding additional charts. So there was, he added a category of aesthetic needs, uh, the need for art and beauty. Um, but when it came to self-actualization, he realized later that actually there's something higher than that, and that's transcendence. And this is spirituality. It's, uh, it's God. It's a sense of uh, calling on your life or a sense of serving other people. And, and so he came to see that in the end, it, it moves away from, when you reach that highest level, you've moved away from being focused on the self, and you're focused on, well, in essence, as Jesus said, the two great commandments, loving God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and loving your neighbor as you love yourself. So what I find interesting about this is that when we are engaged in serving other people, so we have enough to eat and we're not worried about those lower level needs, and we begin to focus on how can God use me to make a difference for other people, we find that those higher level needs that we begin to experience, like, you know, I, I want to know that my life matters and that, you know, there's some meaning to my life, we find those are fulfilled because we were made for those things. So I want to end the session by telling you the story of a young man named Jeff Hansen. Jeff's uh, been a member of Church of the Resurrection since he was just a little boy. And as a child, he was diagnosed with neurofibromatosis uh, type 1, which is, uh, these are tumors that develop on, the, on various nerves. In his case, it was on the optic nerve in the brain. And by the time he was, I think, 9 or 10 years old, it was clear that he was visually impaired. He couldn't see the things other children could see. But he could see things other children couldn't see. So he's a bit of an entrepreneur, and when he was, I think, 12 years old, he had this idea of having a bake sale on the front lawn of their house. Uh, his mom was a great, he has a great chef and baker, and, and, uh, and what he loved to do was he loved to paint. 
he painted note cards with watercolors. And so he would sell his note cards, uh, watercolor note cards, and he would sell his mom's baked goods. And that summer, by the end of the summer, he had raised $15,000 that he donated to the children's, uh, I think it was the Children's Tumor Network or the Cancer Network, I don't remember which. And, uh, and people began to want more of his cards. And so he began to paint more, and he began to expand into different kinds of, uh, of you know, painting and medium that he was using. And they were beautiful. And over time, people came to hear his story. Uh, it was Elton John first who heard his story. Uh, he had gone to a concert, and we wanted to go to a, an Elton John concert uh, as a part of the Make-A-Wish Foundation. So he wanted to meet Sir Elton John. And backstage, when he met Sir Elton John, he presented Elton John with a $1,000 donation, a $1,000 check for his, uh, his orphanages and his, uh, his projects with kids. And Elton John was so taken by that, he wanted to know more about how he, how he come, came up with $1,000. And Elton John ended up commissioning him to paint paintings for his orphanages. And, and then, you know, his story got out from Elton to other people, and, and Warren Buffett ends up buying one of his paintings and references him in his, in his annual talk, and Dale Earnhardt Jr. ends up buying him. And, and, and pretty soon at auction, these paintings are selling. The, the highest sold for over $100,000. Well, by the time he was in high school, he knew he wanted to give away as much as he could to help other people. And so he set a goal. By the time he was 20, he wanted to give a million dollars away, and he did. And uh, then when he reached the age of 20, he decided by the time he was 30, he wanted to give seven point, or no, actually he wanted to give $10 million away by the age of 30. He ended up giving $7.2 million away before he passed away this last year. And I wanted you to hear just a little bit more of his story. Take a look. He was formally diagnosed probably around age six. And we discovered that he had a tumor that was damaging his optic nerves. And brain tumors are a common feature of neurofibromatosis and that resulted in him being treated with chemotherapy and radiation. Following radiation and chemotherapy, Jeff expressed to us that he had this desire to give back. He wanted to sell his hand-painted watercolor note cards at the foot of our driveway. I really prayed about that and thought about what gift do I have that I could offer to this formula? and that is baking. So I went to work and he would sit there with his visual impairment and hand paint watercolor note cards and I would just keep bringing the baked goods out to the bake sale. And at the end of that summer, Jeff had a grand total of $15,000 to gift to the Children's Tumor Foundation for neural fibromatosis research. In seven years from that point, we quit our jobs and started working for Jeff and his art business. At the eve of his 20th birthday, we announced that he had given a million dollars to charity. And I was sitting there going, this is the kid I had no more dreams for. So Jeff says it like this. It's, it's not the challenge, but rather your response to the challenge that defines you. Jeff has sort of core belief. Core belief. Mm -hmm. And it, it goes like this, every act of kindness helps create kinder communities, more compassionate nations, and a better world for all, even one painting at a time. And that's why he just keeps giving them away. It's the joy of giving. So the last time I went to see Jeff before he passed, uh, he hadn't been able to speak for two or three days. And uh, when I arrived at the house, I walked in and I said, hi, Jeff. And he would raise an eyebrow. His eyes were closed, but he'd raise an eyebrow. It's his way of saying, I'm still with you. I hear you. And um, we sat down together with his mom and dad, and they recounted his remarkable story and all the places he'd been and the, and the people he'd known and the chance that he'd had to give away all of these resources and uh, the difference that he had made. And we shared scripture together, and then we prayed. I took the anointing oil, I made the sign of the cross in his forehead, and we gave him to Jesus. And at the end of that prayer, I said, now let's pray together the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray. And as we prayed, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, this young man who hadn't spoken in three days began to move his lips and pray this prayer with us. And they were the last words that, that Jeff would ever say. And Jeff had lived that prayer. And what he had found is in giving away what he'd given away, his own heart was filled with the epiousius bread, with the daily bread that satisfies.
So, and that's a, just an amazing story of what the daily bread of our Savior can do for us. It sustains us, but it does so in such a way that we can give to others that same bread. When our God feeds us, He's telling us that we need to help feed others, physically, emotionally, and spiritually. And that's the challenge of this prayer. It continually is about us asking God to come into us, but then Christ redirects that energy and says, now you need to give it out to others. You need to pour it out to the people around you. And so as we go forth tonight, let us be strengthened by that story. Let us be challenged by that story of what Jeff did. How can we give to others that bread of life? The bread that satisfies for eternity. And that will be our prayer and our action as a church. So now in closing, uh, let's stand as we sing together, Fairest Lord Jesus, hymn number 123. Following, uh, as you leave the sanctuary, again, you can uh, get any leftovers that you would like to take or to share with others um, for a small donation. And so uh, now let us go forth in the power, peace, and protection of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And it is in His name that we pray. Amen. Amen.